Rahim, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate. All praises to Allah, the creator of the universes and their sustainer, the provider of believers and unbelievers. And may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets, the last of his messengers and his holy progeny. Glorified is Allah who in his holy book, in the chapter of Ali Imran in verse 168 says, Consider not those who are slain in the path of Allah as dead, for they are alive, receiving their sustenance from their Lord. The holy words being, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ The holy verse that I recited is again a verse so commonly heard in uh, majalises as applicable to Imam Hussein alayhi salam vis-a-vis our various angles towards him. Whether we sit here to commemorate his martyrdom in the knowledge that he joins us in, this, in these uh, sittings or whether we present salam to him as we just did before starting on the completion of the first majlis. The, the, the reality is that he is alive. He listens to that salam. And as it is correct to say that the teaching is that to make salam to someone is highly recommended and carries great sabab. To respond to it is, is wajib. It is obligatory to reply. What to say of an imam who, who has isma? If a salam is sent to him, would he not reply? That is our logic. That is our, our, our stand. And we derive that stand from this holy verse. Wala tahsabanna. Allah says, don't even imagine. There is another ayah which says, don't say. Wala taqul which is a different ayah. This one is still stronger. It says, Wala tahsabanna, don't even imagine conceptually that those who are slain in the path of Allah are dead. They are not. Subhanallah wa ta'ala says they are alive. Was it not enough for him to say, Wala tahsabanna ladhi qutila fi sabilillahi amwata? That don't think, don't imagine that they are dead made the point very succinctly unequivocally but Allah goes a step further adds a word and says two words rather a preposition and a, and, and a noun says Bal ahyaun, but they are alive don't think they are dead but they are alive and as though those two parts of the ayah were not enough he further supports it by saying Bal ahyaun, and they receive sustenance from Allah Live people need sustenance. We need sustenance to remain ex- uh, in existence. If these who are dead, who we think are dead, are really alive, they too must require sustenance. And Allah says, indeed so, they actually are in receipt of that sustenance from Allah. In the Rabbihim Well, the purpose of citing this, making this ayah the heading of the sitting tonight, of course, is a different one. But I thought I should amplify this and introduce this ayah because it is so often heard in majalises. (coughs) The reason I put put this ayah in is in winding up our discussions on Ahad so that we move on with the Jews. And the whole of this evening, it appears, inshallah, will be occupied only in discussing the rule, the role of the Jews. After all the shuhada, the martyrs were buried in Ahad, and uh, matters moved on, as you know, the Holy Prophet moved on about eight miles to ensure there was no attack, and people came back to Medina. One would have thought, that the martyrs will be left to lie in peace. They've given their lives 
served their purpose. But no, about 45 years later, that is in about 47 AH, after Hijra, Muawiyah, who was then the Caliph of the Muslims, with his seat in Damascus, decided that there should be a tract, a canal built over that very piece of land. Don't ask me why he chose that land. I'm sure after what I spoke yesterday, you will be able to imagine yourselves. But be that as it may, he decided that particular spot be chosen for the canal and the canal should run over the, the area which had the graves of the martyrs. Well, the governor wrote back saying, you asked me to do this, but it cannot be done because there are these graves and uh, there is no way the canal can be built without disturbing the graves. And if we build them on the graves, that is not possible either. It is neither politically correct nor viable from an engineering angle. Hence, Muawiyah was stuck and he ordered that all these bodies of uh, the martyrs be exhumed and be reburied in safe places so that the canal, of course, can, can run undisturbed. How much more important to have the canal than uh, to, to see that these holy bodies of martyrs are not disturbed? But be that as it may, that is not my point in discussion. My point in discussion is that when those graves were opened up so that these bodies are removed to be reburied in adjacent areas, it was found that each one of those bodies was intact. Not, no decomposition at all. All of them found absolutely intact as though they had just been buried an hour ago. And this information comes not through our sources, but through Umayyad sources. Indeed, it does not even end there. When they were digging the grave of Hamza to remove his body, by error, one of them, one of the workers struck on Hamza's foot. And when Hamza's foot was struck like that, it began bleeding profusely immediately. Indeed, Hamza's foot needed to be treated as though you treat the foot of a living human being so that the blood stops oozing. And the treatment given to a human, living human, became necessary so that at least the body could be removed without blood oozing all over and reburied in safer place where we now go to Medina and salute him. Well, you might have thought that at least would have given Muawiyah some, some inkling that these people were so much on the right that 45 years later Allah would have kept their bodies intact. He would have earned some faith in this holy verse in Al Imran that do not even think that these are dead, they are alive to all intents and purposes. And a number of such examples exist. It is thus, it is just that this example fell in the path of my narration. And I thought I add that to your large list of such graves being reopened and the bodies found intact. <coughs> oh no, indeed, after that, it is two or three years after that that he poisoned Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And ten years later that Karbala took place one would have thought there would be an end to lessons Allah needs to teach. Some will never learn. And indeed they didn't in this, in this narration of events either. After all this that happened in Ahad, and after the fact that they had to run away and could not succeed, the Meccans did not rest in peace, nor did the Jews. Now, the Jews felt that the Muslims have had some setback. Some Muslims were killed. They had some problems. The Prophet was injured. His two teeth were broken. So the Muslims will be demoralized. This is the opportunity. Three groups now unite against the Muslims. One is the Meccans. 
they always continued with their, with their venom. <clears throat> and they were the ones who would be the standard bearers. They would be able to show their attack openness. Second was that group of the Munafikun we talked about. But to their list were added some more Arabs. Christian Arabs joined that group. Some other Arabs joined that group also for other reasons which I do not want to go into. Making that group much larger and now the Jews coming forth in open. The first incident in which the Jews thought they could, uh, they could uh, take advantage of the situation took place indeed in the same year, the second year after Hijrah. This is the group of Bani Hunayka and the narration almost unanimous of all historians as to the events is that there was a Muslim lady passing in a bazaar and went to a Jewish shop. There, there were some Jews who treated her indecently, indeed, indecently assaulted her. When they indecently insulted her, some Muslims around objected to it. And there was a melee. Immediately more Jews came in. And ultimately, you'll be surprised, those Jews actually killed the Muslim who was trying to help this uh, Muslim girl. And so more Muslims came in. And the Holy Prophet got the news. <clears throat> the Holy Prophet ordered that the Jews and the Muslims should come over to them. But the Jews disagreed and stuck to the place. Ultimately, the Muslims came in and they killed the Jew who killed the Muslim. By then, the Holy Prophet got there in person. And it is only when the Holy Prophet got there in person that he was able to control the Muslims away. The Jews, unfortunately, were abusive. They had the audacity to treat the Holy Prophet with indecent words. That Prophet, who you must, might remember two, three nights back we discussed, had a pact given to them on his own volition, not on their asking, on his own volition. And the first term being that no Jew will be insulted, no Jew will be abused, he will not even be called a Yahudi. Even that expression will not be used. Those Jews whose sanctity whose self-respect was, was, was uh, not only respected, but, but ordained and decreed by the Holy Prophet, then had the courage, and this was only a year ago, had the courage to treat the Holy Prophet with abusive language. The Holy Prophet found the situation totally unacceptable. He called the Jews and told them that whatever abuses you may want to hurl is one thing, that is a matter for me to decide. You're talking, you're talking of a forgiving person to that extent. That is a matter for me to decide. But what is not acceptable is that you, in the first place, should treat any lady, whether Muslim or Jewish, with indecency. And that matter should have been reported to me under the charter and I would have judged between you. But you took law in your own arms. And when that Muslim objected, you went so far as to kill him. This conduct is unacceptable. You provoked, you provoked a, a, a civil disorder in which two people got killed. This is totally unacceptable. We have got to resolve this issue once and for all. I appreciate you are not observing the pact. If you wish to annul the pact, I will accept it at the annulment, but Provisions for maintenance of law and order will have to be brought about in an effective and efficient way. <coughs> that, you might think, is what any ruler of any country would do today. Absolutely in keeping with civilized standards. The Jews rebutted with rudeness and arrogance. And they literally told the Holy Prophet in so many words that they were not accepting his authority, they were not accepting his sanction. The Holy Prophet then said that if you do not accept my authority or my sanction in this, country, in this land, how will you continue to survive? Are we going to have a land with civil disorder, with civil disputes culminating in criminal acts day in, day out? Because you do not accept my authority, you therefore are a law unto yourselves. And we cannot have a situation in which there are two systems of government running in parallel in the same stretch of land.
you might think well in keeping with today's thinking let alone the thinking of that time this is why i've always said from the first night that study of the life of the holy prophet is a study of ethics we need even today for our own safe administration of our affairs they said that is not our concern we have spoken to you and that is the end of the matter the holy prophet said if things are going to end that way with you then you have two choices either all of you become muslims straight away in which case they would straight away come under his under his jurisdiction under his domain his word would be a divine order on them from an apostle of allah so either you all become muslims or you all leave this place you all are expelled the jews said we have told you that we don't recognize you we have told you your word has no sanction on us so what is the point in your asking us either to become muslim or to leave the place we are going to do neither and the holy prophet said very well if that is the case <coughs> i will decide what action to take tomorrow they went back they realized something will happen they did not want to be to be victims of any affair so they grouped themselves up in their fortress they used to have huge fortresses and the holy prophet decided very next day that they will besiege that fortress again imam ali alayhi salam was made the flag bearer he moved on with a contingent of uh, of muslim fighters and the entire fortress was besieged it it, it certainly was irksome to the muslims but even more inconvenient to the jews because now no supplies could go in because the the besiegers would make sure there is no supply going in no water could go in no armaments could go in and they were told that we will not enter until it becomes necessary you decide what you want to do but you will not leave your fort fortress except to leave the country for good for 14 days you will be surprised for 14 days they lived in that fortress under siege but did not move you can see the extent of the determination of these jews now to challenge literally that is the word to challenge the authority of the holy prophet but the holy prophet treated them with that degree of consideration and violence would a country however small today tolerate that situation in civilized circumstances would they not have barraged into the fort in a matter of couple of days why should that army be there for 14 days only only tolerating the arrogance of the jews but the holy prophet did not take that stand non violence was the extreme teaching of the holy prophet at all costs and if it is going to cost keeping the army there for 14 days is so bad but violence will not commence from the hands of a muslim ultimately the jews gave way if only we would take lesson from that even today and make sure that there is no violence any day from any muslim hand to any other person whether it be in our homes or whether it be in the mosque or in our social clubs or in our daily lives after 14 days the jews gave in they told the holy prophet that they've decided to go and look at the orders of the holy prophet he said yes if you've decided to go you will leave peacefully <coughs> and you will be allowed to take all your movable properties with you you cannot take immovable property obviously because it does not move but you can carry all your movable properties with you except arms you will leave your arms behind secondly well, that was the first order to the jews secondly the order to the muslims no muslim is to molest a jew in any way whilst he exits from medina to wherever he wishes to go and the bani kaiduka left unmolested unharassed taking away 
all their movables and unfortunately destroying their houses, their immovable property so that the Muslims do not benefit from them. The Holy Prophet was quite content that they should do so. What he then did was <coughs> he called up the Ansars. One is perplexed to see the level of justice with which this man acted even in those days. Those teachings of justice cannot even be found in our charters of modern days. He calls the Ansars and says, you have been settled here for long in Medina. The Muhajireen who came with me from Mecca have no immovable properties. They have no land to cultivate because all land has been yours. And I have never interfered with your land. I have never allowed them to come and uh, cultivate your land or take over your land, even as your Muslim brothers, because the land belongs to you. It is only those whom you yourselves willingly allowed to use your pieces of land who entered on your land. Otherwise, it was trespass. But now, the, the, the commonwealth has received all these plantations, all this land. Although they have damaged it, but the land is there to recultivate. All this land is in the hands of the commonwealth. It is not the property of any individual. Will communism have lessons to learn from this conduct of the Holy Prophet? He says it does not belong to any individual. It belongs to the community as a whole. I could partition it amongst the community as a whole. I do not propose to do so. Because if I did so, I would have to partition it between you and the Muhajirs. You, of course, are in the majority. There were people who have always lived in Medina. Uh, hand, only uh, some hundreds came from, uh, from uh, Mecca. <coughs> you will get the majority. What I fear is, you have your lands. These people who have come with me have no land at all. If you are happy, Ravi is the word, if you are happy and you permit me, look at this, the Holy Prophet, working on permission from his devotees, if you permit me, I will grant all this land to the Muhajirs, so that they too have some land to cultivate. And as always, as you heard last night, so you hear tonight again, that the Muhajirs with, with the Ansars with a single voice say to the Holy Prophet, we are content to that, give it all to them, and we do not want even a square inch of that property. Let the Muhajirs have a source of their independent sustenance. However, the Holy Prophet turned to the Muhajirs and said, you will have this land, but when I divide it amongst you, I will include two Ansars. Because whilst it was true what I said, that the Ansars have their land which they cultivate, I know two Ansars within that community. Here is a leader who knows every member of his community, particularly those who are not well provided for. Those are the ones for whom his greatest concern lies. I know two, he says, who have no property at all. They do not have land at all. So I will include them in your numbers and divide the properties equally. And the Ansars, of course, immediately said they are welcome to, 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 uh, to partake in the partition of the property along with us. And thus was that property distributed. But the Jews who had left <coughs> were not prepared to forget the story. They left with anger and with rancor. They settled near Khaiba. You can see I'm already introducing my next subject. They settled near Khaiba. And uh, that is where there was another pocket of Jewish settlement. But soon, in the, in the fourth year after Hijrah, another group of Jews became troublesome. The Abu Nazir. They, of course, were extremely troubled that Banu Kainuka had to leave uh, Medina and lost their immovable property and were extremely unhappy with governance under the Holy Prophet although they were treated fairly their, their intent was that they should be in the seat of government which the Holy Prophet could never have permitted so minor trifling matters to annoy the Prophet continued. 
But it reached a limit when on one occasion they decided now that they must rid of the Holy Prophet. If the, if the Meccans could not do so, if the Qurayshites could not do so, if Badr and Ahad could not do so, they will do it. <coughs> Indeed, they told the Holy Prophet this at one, one, one occasion in clear words. Well, maybe I should come to that also. One, one day, they invited a num the Holy Prophet and some companions to their fortress for a meal, a reception. Now you can see how delicate that situation becomes. If the Holy Prophet declines to go, then he as the head of the commonwealth is discriminating between Muslim invitations and Jewish invitations. By protocol he decided he will go, much as he was unhappy to go. Whilst he was there, <coughs> he noticed that he was seated, he was being asked to sit, at a place where the roof was slanting. And he realized that there is some mischief here. As time progressed, he became convinced that there was mischief. So what he did was, without disturbing the other Muslims, he quietly left the place unnoticed. The Jews came to see that the Holy Prophet had gone. But because the other Muslims were all seated there, and the Holy Prophet left them, because he could see that they are in safety, only his position was in danger. The other Jews on seeing that the Holy Prophet is gone, but the other companions are all there, became convinced that he has gone only <coughs> to come back. When the Prophet did not come back, more and more of the companions began to move away. And soon it was discovered that the purpose of that meeting was not to give a reception to the Holy Prophet, but to finish him. And the, 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 the strategy was that a millstone was kept on that roof, the slanting roof. At the appropriate occasion, it would be released, it would roll down and down onto the head of the Holy Prophet to finish him. The Holy Prophet was saved in, uh, in nick of time. The very next day he summoned the Banu Nadir and revealed to them this story, <coughs> this information with the evidence to establish it. Banu Nadir were in no position to resist the argument. Their simple answer is, we do not accept what you say and have nothing more to tell you. We do not find ourselves same arrogance as that, as that of Badi Kunaika. We do not find ourselves answerable to you or accountable to you. <coughs> the Holy Prophet immediately gave them exactly the two options that he gave to Badi Kunaika. Either you become Muslims or you leave this commonwealth immediately. Their answer was exactly that that was given by their predecessors. We do not recognize these orders. We will neither become Muslims nor leave this place and went into the fortress. Exactly the same story repeats. The Holy Prophet orders siege of the fortress again. The siege lasts for 14 days, at the end of which they came back saying, we are prepared to go in safety. Allow us to go as you allowed our brothers the Bani Kunaika to, Kunaika to go. And the Holy Prophet said, yes, exactly same treatment. You can go. You too can take all your movables. Same consideration from the Holy Prophet leave your immovable property behind, leave your armament behind. And they left. They too settled <coughs> with, uh, in the vicinity of, uh, of uh, the area of settlement of the Jews. Well, so you can see, situation building up in which the Jews are all now accumulated in one area, all disturbed with the, by the Holy Prophet, all had signed the pact, all rejected the pact. On the other hand, there were the Makkans, equally hurt, yet for two years they were not able to do anything substantive, minor things which were controlled by the Muslims anytime they wanted to, to cause problems in Medina or in the vicinities of Medina. <coughs> and so, there is a large group now accumulating against the Muslims. Apart from these two, the third that I mentioned, the Munafikun and the, the Christian Muslims and the other Bedouins, 
all joined hands. And in the fifth year after Hijrah, there marches on to Medina a colossal army. A colossal army of 10,000 people. This time, 4,000 from Mecca. 4,000 people from Mecca. You remember 3,000 from Ahad? The Ahad figure has gone up to 4,000 marching down from Mecca. 3,000 Jews and 3,000 of the other numbers that I gave of the Arabs, Christian, Munafikun and the Badwits. <coughs> the Holy Prophet gets the message that it's 10,000 people now coming down. The Holy Prophet of course did not have 3,000. The most he mustered in uh, Ohad, you remember, was a thousand, of whom the 300 Munafikun and the Jews deserted him. So he was fighting only with 700. A quarter, less than a quarter of the numbers that the Makkans had brought. The Holy Prophet, of course, was staggered by this situation. <coughs> he therefore decided that Medina needs to be buttressed. Medina was built by stone houses adjacent to each other. That created a wall. So he said that will remain a wall to stop the enemy coming in. But the northwestern portion of Medina was wide open. It was so open that it was very easy for the enemy just to move in. The Holy Prophet decided that maybe the strategy of Ahad did not work as well as he would have liked it to. And this time he will not go out to meet them. He will fight them in Medina. <coughs> but how to organize that northwestern large open area? And that is where a brilliant idea from Salman became of immense value to the Muslims. He suggested that a trench be built, a moat. And, and you will see that that example of moat was since followed in many countries. You will see them in European countries. You will see them in the United Kingdom. Various places that, that particularly the kings used those moats around their palaces. His idea was build a moat, therefore keep the, the enemy at bay. A large moat was therefore built throughout that area which was open. So that the enemy had no access to Medina. A moat 15 feet wide and 15 feet deep was to be dug. The news is that the enemy is already out of Mecca. Work had to go on at a colossal rate. Everybody chipped in. <coughs> Indeed, according to one report, the work was finished in six days. According to another, in three days, the moat was ready. Such was the enthusiasm of the Muslims working along with the Holy Prophet. And the Holy Prophet physically worked on the moat himself. He always did. We mentioned the building of the mosque at Medina. Even in the building of the mosque at Medina, the Holy Prophet personally contributed by his labor as well, apart from the 2,000 mithqal of gold that he gave to Sohel and Suhail to buy the land. He contributed in his physical sweat as well. Indeed, Ammar, Ammar Yasser, always went to his help. Not only did his share of the job, did a large portion of the Prophet's share of the job, and earned the blessings of the Holy Prophet. The Prophet predicted for him that that he would 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 also be martyred. Indeed, Ammar asked him, "O oh Prophet, will I have the honor?" This was the attitude of the Muslims. Will I have the honor of being martyred in your cause? And the Holy Prophet says, "Yes, but not in my lifetime, Ammar. You will be martyred when you will be fighting with Ali and at the hands of a rebel." More of that perhaps next year, a, full, a, fuller, a fuller version of that, of that hadith. <coughs> to proceed, the Holy Prophet too took part in the building of the moat. When the moat was ready, the Holy Prophet accumulated his army. It came to a meager figure of a thousand people. Uh, sorry, three thousand people. Just less than a third of what was being expected from the opposite uh, enemy camp. However, he lined them along the moat so that the moat was fully protected. Any attempt to cross the moat, to mo the moat, the enemy would be killed and Medina would be saved. 
all ladies and women in the vicinity of Medina were asked to move out and to reside within within the city of Medina in the houses and if there was no room in the houses on the terraces so that protection of the women and children became easy but the story did not end there <coughs> there was a pocket of Jews Banu Kureza still left in Medina you can imagine the strength of their settlement they were in Medina they had entered into pact with the Holy Prophet that they would like all the others that they would join in the defense of Medina they were approached and one who was most friendly to them the leader of the 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 house Marsab who you remember announced to the ladies of Medina that they should go to 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 weep and wail over Hamza he was sent he too could not communicate with them he came back with the news to the Holy Prophet that the Jews are even more arrogant and even more steadfast than they ever have been they have refused to cooperate with you at all the Holy Prophet said very well we have 3,000 that is not my anxiety my anxiety is that <coughs> there might well be a secret treaty between the Meccans and the Jews that the Meccans will attack us from the front not knowing that there was already a moat a, a trench and the Jews will come out of the fortress and attack us from behind so that we have two battles at a go a running battle civil rebellion within our own city and an attack from uh, the enemy from abroad internal and external defenses became uh, of, 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 of importance simultaneously the Holy Prophet could not trust them and could not take a chance yet his people were so few <coughs> nonetheless he decided that the protection of the children and women was so preeminent that he cannot ignore that even for a minute he decided 500 people from his contingent will be removed and they will be made to parade the streets of Medina day and night so that at any attempt the slightest movement from the Jews will be discerned they would take part in defending the Muslim children and wives and resisting the attack of the of the uh, Jews the majority 2500 will stop the attackers coming in so that the Jews are in small numbers if they need help more help would be provided from those guarding the trench that was the strategy of the Holy Prophet you can now see that the person who I started calling a teacher that gentle person who teaches just good manners who teaches you must make salam as you enter and you must greet your Muslim brothers those who are standing should greet those who are sitting those who are riding should greet those who are walking all sorts of rules only to preserve courtesies and good behavior and gentleness because that made gentlemen that prophet now is not only a statesman is not only a general in a war is a military strategist and this was his strategy to save the situation the Meccans arrived <coughs> and arrived in large numbers but when they arrived they saw the moat and how many of them could gallop across 15 feet and could they because the boat was thoroughly paraded by Muslim soldiers they remained there to think what to do 14 days again passed the enemy didn't know what to do they were spellbound they were stunned but they wouldn't move but they wouldn't move the situation of course became severe for both sides <coughs> the Muslims suffered because during the day they had to remain there in the heat during the night they had to remain there in the cold because the knights could not be trusted either that was the time when the enemy was seeking ways of penetrating across the the moat in safety when the Muslims would not be alert well <coughs> they had tried that in Badr but we had no time to cover that part of the uh, uh, strategy of the enemy <coughs> maybe next year when we are discussing the role of Imam Ali alayhi salam however 14 days of stress and strain 
ultimately some valiant soldiers of the Meccans decided they will take the leap and fight the Muslims. So about four of them came across. They leapt over the, the, the moat. And when they leapt over the moat, the first to leap was Amr bin Abdawal, a giant of a fighter. Indeed, his reputation amongst the Makkans and the Arabs was that you need a thousand men to fight Amr. That was his reputation. One man, hundred men weren't enough for him. He leapt over the, the, the trench, came in, the others followed, Nofal followed, and two others followed. And he exclaimed, is there any Muslim who is prepared to take a challenge from me? And nobody did. Imam Ali stood up saying to the Prophet that he would, and the Prophet said, stop. He exclaimed the second time, you Muslims, you believe that if you fight <coughs> and kill me, heaven is your reward. If you fight and get killed, you will immediately proceed to heaven. Is there none of you who wants to proceed to heaven? The Holy Prophet turns to his people. Imam Ali says, allow me, O Rasulullah. And the Prophet says, wait. Amr bin Abdawad announces the third time. Imam Ali again stands up and at that stage the Holy Prophet says, very well Ali, if there is none to go, you will go. Not only dresses him with his own coat of mail, gives him his Zulfikar once again. And when Imam Ali alayhi salam was moving to fight Amr bin Abdawad, well recorded in, in history that the Holy Prophet says, Barazal iman kulli ilal kufri kulli. <laughs> he depicted the situation in eloquent and picturesque language. He says there is now a confrontation between complete faith and complete infidelity. If there was a person with total and entire faith in every inch and ounce of him, that was Ali. And if there was any person who was an infidel, a kafir, in every inch, that was Amr bin Abdawad. He says, Barazal iman kulleh ilal kufri kulleh. And when Imam Ali alayhi salam got there, Amr bin Abdawad says, O oh Ali, <coughs> I am not keen to fight you because your father was a friend of mine. And indeed, I have been to his house and had a meal at his house. I am not keen to fight you. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, yes, Amr, but you are leaving no choice to me because you are announcing, is there anybody who is willing to fight you? So if you make that announcement, you take the answer as well and I am the one who is answered. Amr bin Abdawad says, yes, but there may be others who can answer. And, uh, and I am not keen to fight you. Imam Ali says, oh Amr bin Abdawad, you may not be keen to fight me, but I am keen to go to heaven. So I am keen to fight you. Let us proceed. And you give me the first attack because we Muslims never start an attack. So you attack me first so that I can respond. Amr bin Abdawad was then on his steed, a tall, hefty horse. Imam Ali was on his feet because there were not enough horses in the Muslim army. <coughs> Amr bin Abdawad says, O oh Ali, do you have any request to make? Meaning you are going to die if there are any wasiyas, do them now. Imam Ali alayhi salam twists that question and says, O oh Amr, last night you made a vow to your idol. And Amr bin Abdawad was shattered. That vow was made by him in his tent in total secrecy at midnight to his idol. You can imagine what uh, Kulli Kufr this man is. He addresses his idol. He seeks help from his idol before he comes to this, uh, to, to this fight. And makes promise, another, what we would call another, to, to, to his idol. <coughs> and he says in his vow that any adversary who comes and makes three requests, I will accept one of them for him. 
Imam Ali says, Oh, Amr bin Abdawad, you vowed last night to your idol that you would request, accept one of three requests of your adversary. Amr bin Abdawad was baffled. He did not want to accept. He couldn't deny. Because here was information nobody knew except he. I don't know whether he even believed that the idol knew. But there would at the most be those two. How does Ali know? And how does he come to know? It shatters him. <coughs> but this was not a psychological game. It was a military strategy of Imam Ali alayhi salam. He says, well, he doesn't accept or deny. He says, why? Do you have any requests? He says, yes. I will make the three requests first, O Amr bin Abdawad. And look at this. When you are talking of Iman Kulleh, he says, O Amr bin Abdawad, accept that there is no God but Allah and the Holy Prophet is his true Prophet. First of any requests that Ali would make. And he says, no. O Ali, if I was to accept that, what am I doing here? Why have I come to fight? And Imam Ali says, very well. If you do not want to do that, my second request is, do not have this fight. You go away. What the others do is a matter for their decision. You are a master of your own decision. You go away. And he says, oh, but if I go away, Ali, even the women of Makkah will say, Amr bin Abdawad was a coward and he ran away. Is that more important than saving yourself from the fire of hell? What the women of the world can do? Abra bin Abdawad says, no, that is not acceptable. So Ali says, if that is not acceptable, then let us have a fair fight. <coughs> and Abra bin Abdawad says, yes, that I accept. He says, well, how do you accept that when you are on a horse and I am on my feet? Fairness demands, you come down too. Amr bin Abdawad says, yes, I vowed I will accept one of the three requests. This is the request I will accept. He still thought he was a tall, huge fellow, Imam Ali, not that tall. He was hefty. He was so weighty. He needed a thousand people to kill him. <coughs> he had heard of the valor of Ali, but he was confident of his own valor. Although he was shattered that Ali knew what happened the night before between him and his God. And the battle starts. Ali insists on Amr bin Abdawad. You give the first stroke you attack me first one would want to start where is the allegation that islam was spread by the sword how unjust how malicious and amr bin abdawad does start and in due course so much sand is blown that nobody sees of what is going on in the battle all you hear is the wrestling of swords but in that wrestling of swords there suddenly is a cry from Imam Ali, Allahu Akbar, meaning he has killed Amr bin Abdawad. And the Holy Prophet, sitting in his camp, immediately replied, Allahu Akbar. And the army knew that Amr bin Abdawad was gone. <coughs> when the dust settled, all that the armies saw was Amr bin Abdawad on the ground, Imam Ali on his breast, completing the cutting of his head. And when he brings his head to the Holy Prophet, the Holy Prophet sings a song for him instantly. He says, One stroke of Imam Ali on this day of Khandak is superior to the worship of both the Thakalain, both the jinn and the ins from now to the day of judgment. The import of that particular saying, I will not deal with tonight. <coughs> but the sister of Amr bin Abdawad comes to cry over his body and says, Oh Amr bin Abdawad, I would have cried on your body, but need I cry or need I be proud that you were killed by a person so noble? Such a Muslim that he was. More of this next year. But that was because Amr bin Abdawad was full of jewelry on his body. 
more of this next year but only a passing remark full of jewelry imam ali was only concerned with his head not with his chains or with his necklaces or any other ornament that he may have had of diamonds or gold on his body indeed i say this not with recount in context of imam ali alayhi salam in the context of the holy prophet the holy prophet ordered that she be allowed to take over from the body of amr bin abdul any jewelry she wanted to take away that was the holy prophet in that battle of ohad <coughs> The story is not over of Khandak. I beg your pardon. We are not talking of Ohad. We are talking of the Battle of Khandak, known as the Battle of Mot, known as the Battle of Trench, in Arabic also known as the Battle of Ahzab. <coughs> Ahzab, because so many forces joined to fight the Muslims. It appears we must continue tomorrow. Tomorrow I shall see. I shall discuss how. when they saw that they could not but let me finish with nofal in a, in in less than a minute nofal was there the other three were there when this happened the other two escaped jumped over the moat and ran away they said if amr bin abdawad was killed in this way what chance do we stand nofal dropped in the moat he could not leap over and when he dropped muslims started stoning him he shouted to the muslims saying oh muslims You want to kill me? You are now welcome to kill me. But please don't throw stones at me. Don't kill me this way. Come and cut my head off and I will be content. Immediately Ali orders. Look at this. Immediately Ali Ali orders all stones stopped. I will leap and finish his job. He leaps into the trench, cuts off Nofal's head and says to the Muslims, "Here is the head that you were looking for." And surrenders it to the Muslims. that was the lesson of imam ali alayhi salam in khandaq why why do i ask in karbala was each one of the martyrs who fought on behalf of imam hussein alayhi salam stone each one of them was stone aun muhammad was stone they were killing the 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 enemies and the enemies decided that they would stone him and one person who was uh, indeed imam hussein himself was stoned so badly <coughs> indeed people climbed on whatever trees they could find only to be able to stone imam hussein alayhi salam may allah increase his mercy on imam hussein alayhi salam and one person badly stoned was abu fadl al abbas alayhi salam he was that faithful commander of of imam hussein alayhi salam whom we remember on this night dedicated to him the 8th of muharram indeed so dedicated to imam hussein alayhi salam that his own ego was non existent in in, uh, in 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 the presence of imam hussein alayhi salam when they landed in karbala and he was the commander of the army he pitched the tents next to furaz imam hussein asks him why he did so he says well we are the first to arrive we will choose our site as is the rule of the game <coughs> on the 7th orders are issued on the 7th orders are issued by umar ibn sa'd that orders have arrived from uh, from uh, kufa that the tents of imam hussein be removed from there to such a distance away that that not even the breeze from the river would reach the children of imam hussein <laughs> that was the distance to move and hazrat abbas says not an inch of these tents will go and i dare anyone to touch any one of them imam hussein calls the abbas and says oh abbas indeed imam hussein calls me be zaid along so that she is present when this is said so that hazrat abbas has the presence of two children of fatima to 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 compel him into this says oh abbas i do not want to start this battle on water i do not want history to say that because imam hussein wanted water yazid did not want to give him water so this battle started let it be for islam and abbas says Ya Ibn Rasulillah if that is your order I will move but shall I move them a little distance away and Imam said no Abbas not even that move them as far away from the river that my children cannot even have the breeze of <laughs> from this river Abbas says so be it my brother if that is your order you are the imam of the time indeed he is not allowed to go to fight when ultimately he is allowed to go to fight the imam takes the sword away from him <laughs> he looks at the imam he looks at the imam pitifully how will i fight now he is told not only that 
take also the mesh of Sakina and bring water or a bath. You are not going to fight the enemy. You are only going to bring water. Yet a bath moves on. And when a bath moves on, he does conquer Furat. He tells the enemy, I am in the Furat. He takes his horse right to the middle of the river and turns to the, to the enemies and says, you thought you couldn't allow us entry? We didn't want to. When we want to show you, here we are. Releases his, his horse and says, as the as the as the Purdu poet says, he tells his horse, "Pile tu ay faras ke bahut tishda kab hai ham ahle Muhammad pe ye pani haram hai." He tells his horse, "You are so thirsty." Drink water now that is available for us, the family of the Prophet. This water is denied to us. Picks up the water in his hands and throws it away and says, If Azhar is thirsty, <laughs> he says, If Sakina is thirsty, can Abbas have one drop of this water? Throws it all away. But not only that, the horse does not drink. The horse heard this this uh, this verse of uh, of Azad Abbas that if Sakina is thirsty, I will not drink. How will the horse drink? And when he goes back, only with his sword. His left hand is cut off. He moves the alam to his right hand. He is not bothered because the mashk is safe. His other hand is cut off. He is not bothered. The mashk is safe, but. Great honor to this warrior <laughs> that one left hand is gone when the left arm goes. How did he manage to pluck that mesh so quickly into his teeth? That shows his entire concentration on that mesh. The moment the second arm goes, he's not so much worried about anything else. He clasps the alum with his chest, but picks up the, the, the mashk with his teeth. The mashk is now, is now held by him, but it is now open. And then an enemy sends a, a, an arch straight into the mashk. And when the, that arrow hits the mashk and the water drops, you can imagine that every cell in the body of a bath drops. He sees no more meaning in life. Indeed, it is said that at that particular time, Abbas stopped his movement and turned back. This is why when the Imam comes back, he first finds the, the, the right hand, he, the right left arm, he then finds the right arm, and then he comes to the body of Abbas. And when he comes to the body of Abbas, Abbas is still alive. Abbas is now on the ground, still alive. Don't ask me how he came on the ground. You need the two arms to support yourself. So Abbas must just have been thrown onto that ground on the terrace. And he broke his skull. He broke his bones. But there he was when the Imam alayhi salam comes. The words of Abbas, oh my Mawla, I am ashamed. Look at this warrior. <laughs> This is the son of Ali you heard of in Khandaq. This is the son of Ali telling the son of Ali, I am ashamed. You gave me one assignment. I always completed your assignment in life. I do not remember one assignment you gave me, which I did not fulfill to the fullest. Today you told me to bring water for Sakina. <laughs> Today all you told me was to bring water for Sakina. I have not been able to bring it. Hussain says, oh Abbas, don't shame me. I am proud of you. Whoever got a brother like you? And he says, don't take my body. Don't take my body to the, to the camp. But yeah, Hussain, there is blood in my eyes. Please clear my blood. I have no arms, no hands to do so myself. The Imam says, I will. Why do you want the blood cleared? And he says, Oh, Mawla, all I want is to be able to have your last ziyara before my ruh comes out. My salvation lies in last look at you. And this is how Abbas goes. Abbas leaves this earth with his eyes on the eyes of Hussein. <laughs> ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي مقلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون فاتحة